Father, it's a joy to be uh, back together again in this place and with the scriptures open and with your uh, spirit alive in our hearts and, and uh, to instruct us and to encourage us and to bless us and to draw us nearer to Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that you would again do that wonderful work in our hearts tonight and continue to increase our wisdom, continue to increase our uh, <clears throat> understanding of ourselves and of others that we might be able to have that ministry of encouragement in the lives of others, that we, you might give us the, the wisdom and the opportunity to bring the gospel to bear in the lives of people in the areas where they struggle to uh, connect with their um, reality of life, with the reality of Christ within. We ask these things in his name. Amen. So we are building up here a model of, of encouraging and begin with active listening and then we move to compassionate questioning remember this was listening that changes lives and this was uh, the listener responds and then we came to uh, today is heart issues Surfacing. This is the listener. Where were? Oh, oh, oh. No. You're not late enough tonight. The listener <laughs> extends. And then, just to let you in on where we're going from there, then we're going to gospel application for long lasting life change. And that lecture is, we listen to another counsellor. So, last week was compassionate questioning. <laughs> How did you get on this week with practising your compassionate questioning? Talking to somebody just around um, of work, just there work, and um, the stresses of it in his previous job compared to his job now. I'm trying to just see how he's going uh, now that he's changed jobs. We were getting somewhere, but in the middle of it all, suddenly he changed the subject. <laughs> so I didn't sort of get to that. Um, I got to. Um, you got to act of listening? A little bit, and, and the questioning and the, um, what do you call it, the playback? Oh yes, reflect, playback, <laughs> reflect. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of that. It seemed to work, mm. but, but then... Okay. Subject onto um, something more common like sport. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have an experience uh, in going from active listening to compassionate questioning where you um, uh, reflect and uh, and summarize and and ask questions to um, to clarify and to enhance your understanding of the issue no, I have a couple but we then only got a couple of questions into it and then got interrupted by people coming in and out you're on the way. Yeah. Yeah, come on. You never know who's going to turn up in the, the work office. Sometimes you get people come around and talk to them for half an hour, and other times it doesn't happen. What about in your conversations with those closest to you in your life, whoever they might be? You're not doing your homework, children. You're not practicing. I did, no, I did practice a little on my son, who, um, who has started his own business, and when I see him, I want to know how he's getting on, and I'm always nervous to <laughs> crying too much, and um, so I really held back from jumping in, which I tend to do. Okay. And if I just hold back, he gives me more information okay. and if I'm careful about 
the questions I ask, like, just a bit more conscious of it. And did that happen? Did he yes. unload more? Yes. And and, and warm a mother's oh, heart? And kick me in the shins. <laughs> no. No. Yes, it did help. Okay. Mm. We noticed in the role play last week how the questions that were questions related to the words that were said, not related to the assumptions racing around in my head, questions that were relating to the words that were said actually encouraged Ian to talk at a deeper level. Remember that? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about compassionate questioning. Questioning that clarifies, clarifies and reflects back and asks questions designed to encourage conversation. Um, uh, encourage it to move the conversation to where both the listener and the speaker now understands that the listener is is uh, is uh, has heard what they've had to say and understands and is on board with them. So let me hand out my lecture for tonight. Now the listener is going to extend the conversation with thoughtful questions. at how to listen well to the words of others in a way that encourages them to talk at a heart level responding with compassionate words such that the seeker begins to feel heard, understood, hopeful, trusting and safe. That's what we do in last week. We, last week we got to the point where we responded with compassionate questioning, reflecting, clarifying, to enable the seeker to begin to feel heard, understood, hopeful, trusting and safe, rather than uh, thoughtless, poor responding, quick, poor responses, thoughtful, thought through uh, responses, which actually, um, rather than terminating the conversation, invite the speaker to clarify so that they can feel heard and understood. When you get to that point, now you're ready to extend the conversation with careful use of questions to explore what else is going on at the periphery of the conversation. So here we have... We have um, hearer and speaker, or if you like, helper and seeker. Helper and seeker, hearer and speaker. Now. The speaker has spoken words in this direction to the hearer. The hearer has responded with questions compassionately to clarify, to reflect back, to summarize on the words that have been said. You see that? It's directed on the words that have been said. That's where we got to last week. Now we're going to ask further questions that will extend the conversation to the periphery of what has been said. So we're going to move the conversation out here, you see? Beyond what has been shared spontaneously. The reason we're extending the conversation with these questions is in order ultimately to extend it all the way back to the heart of the speaker. So these, uh, these questions eventually will make heart contact. What the speaker has shared spontaneously isn't necessarily a sharing of the issues of the heart. Often they're just sharing of immediate impressions of the situation, of the environment, of the relationship. So now we have to extend the conversation beyond what has been shared spontaneously. Now, but what we have to be careful of is that our questions don't actually have the effect of taking the conversation way out here somewhere where the subject matter changes. 
for instance, here's this, this, your wife comes home, she's been to the supermarket, she ran into this lady from church who treated her rather abruptly, and, and your wife's been worried all afternoon that maybe she's something to upset this lady, and she's telling you about this, and you jump in with a question, and you ask her, uh, <coughs> what was on special in the supermarket while you were there? Did you notice? That's, that's the green line. You've asked a question which has taken the conversation right away from what the speaker came to spontaneously ask. Not only that, your green question is an agenda setting question. Your green question sets the agenda for the conversation on your terms. It's not an invitational question to further conversation, it's an agenda setting question which moves, it out, moves the conversation over to your terms. And you're setting the agenda now for what we shall talk about. Now, in responding that way, you see what you're basically saying to your wife is, I'm not really interested in hearing about your conversation or encounter with that woman. I'm more interested in hearing about specials. You know, what, what wine was on special today? Perhaps. Sorry, did I offend you? What, what, you know, whatever. You see, might not be wine, might not might be biscuits. You see, and, and you see how you set the agenda. You move the conversation away. We do that all the time without even thinking about it. We're feeling uncomfortable with the subject matter, feeling a bit embarrassed. We do that all the time. We do it without thinking. So, to be self-aware, to be self-aware about the impact your questions are having on the conversation. Are they blue questions? Are they red questions? Are they green questions? Now we're ready to extend the conversation with the careful use of questions to explore what else is going on at the periphery of the conversation. We're exploring. We will stay connected to what they have been saying, but we'll begin to bring forward into the conversation their feelings, beliefs and issues that have only yet been hinted at. We'll stay connected to the subject matter. So. Here she is, she's talking to you about uh, how that uh, she met this lady in the supermarket and she uh, had this encounter with her and it didn't go very well and now she's left very confused, she doesn't quite know what to do about it and, uh, and, and, and she pauses and you ask some questions to clarify and to, and to uh, uh, reflect back and now you're ready to ask some extending questions. The listener extends. Some extending questions designed to surface hard issues, and you might ask a question like, what were you feeling the moment she, she kind of walked away? What were you feeling at that moment? And the lady might say, I was feeling hurt. And, 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 what, and how do you feel now? Well, now I just feel angry and confused. Aha, uh -huh. there's been a movement there from feeling confused to feeling from feeling hurt to feeling angry and confused. Now you see you're beginning to explore hard issues. You're beginning to explore the issues at the level of the emotions and you're finding there's been some movement here in the emotions. So you might say, well that's interesting. It sounds like as you've reflected about it, your emotional response to the situation has been changing. Um, can you tell me a bit more about how to account for that change? What, what's going on there for you that you've gone from feeling uh, hurt to being confused and angry? Well, what a wonderful extending question. You've stayed with the topic, you've stayed with the issue, but now you've just pushed it out beyond the periphery of what the lady has been sharing and, and you're, you're, you're asking her to go a little bit deeper than what she shared spontaneously and to reflect upon her emotions and what she's feeling. You can open some windows if you like, it's a bit stuffy in here. So we'll stay connected to what they've been saying, but begin to bring forward into the conversation their feelings, beliefs and issues that have only yet been hinted at. So that was a question about feelings. You might, um, you might ask a question about belief. You might say, when, when she walked away from you there at the supermarket, um, what, did you, what did you tell yourself was true? about you and your relationship with her. Well, at that point it seemed to me like the relationship had broken down completely. And I began wondering if I'd done something to offend her, okay? There's some beliefs there. Belief one, the relationship's broken down. Belief two, I've done something to upset her. 
Now, at that point, you don't jump in and say, oh, no, 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 you couldn't have anything to upset her. You see, that's one of those poor responding responses that, you know, minimise. But you explore that with her, ask more extending questions about the history of the relationship, the nature of the relationship, what's, what encounters has she had with that lady in, in, in recent days. You see where we're going with that? Feelings, beliefs, issues, they haven't yet been hinted at. This will encourage, prompt and facilitate the exploration of the speaker's or seeker's concerns beyond what has been shared spontaneously. This will move us both, speaker and hearer, forward in developing depth of insight into the seeker's heart and struggles. Remember we looked last week at Philippians 1, 9 to 11 and we talked about Paul s says that his prayer is that love would abound more and more in depth in knowledge and depth of insight. Well what's been shared spontaneously the black words gives you knowledge. The blue questions, compassionate question confirms that, that you and the speaker both share the same set of knowledge. Now the red questions are designed for depth of insight. Philippians 1.10 Consider the use of questions by Jesus and by God in the scriptures. They often ask people questions. You notice that? Their questions are not used to gain information that they didn't already know. Yet God knows it all to probe, prompt, extend and explore the person's situation. For instance, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, um, Adam has sinned and uh, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, you had it, buddy. I'm going to consume you with everlasting fire for your sin. Now, God would have been perfectly just, wouldn't he, to have done that? He had said to the man, You will surely die. He didn't do that. He asked him a question Where are you, Adam? didn't ask that question because God was lacking in his fund of knowledge and he needed Adam's answer to complete his own reservoir of knowledge. God is not in any way constrained by his creation. God's knowledge is absolute. Absolute knowledge of all things. He knew exactly where Adam was. He knew exactly what tree Adam was hiding behind. He could direct his question directly to the tree concerned. Where are you Adam? So if God knew where Adam was, what was the purpose of the question? Find out where he was hiding. Verse 10, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Why did God ask that question? So that Adam would reveal his situation. Adam would understand his own situation. Okay, what was it that you said Paul a moment ago? To find out why Adam was hiding. To find out why Adam was hiding? Well God knew why Adam was hiding. He, he didn't ask the question in order to increase his own knowledge of the situation. Perhaps he, he wanted Adam to know why Adam was hiding. Okay, so the question was designed to get Adam to be self-reflective. The question was designed to get Adam to look into his own heart and acknowledge what he saw there. So Adam looked into his heart, verse 10, and what did he find? What did he find there in his own heart? Fear. Fear and what else? Shame. Fear and shame. And having encountered fear and shame, what did he do? 
He ran away to hide. To hide his fear and shame from God. He wanted to be left alone with his fear and shame. And God came after him. God came after him with a question, with an extending question, designed to surface Adam's heart issues. Ha! Why would God do that? Why would God even bother to do that? God knows about the fear and the shame in Adam's heart. Why would God do that? Get Adam to understand it. Yes, that was the goal. What does that tell you about God? What does that tell you about God? Sorry. Sue? Leading Adam to confess. Or... Yes, he brought him to confession. Yes. But what does that tell you about God? Buddy, you've had it. Fire is going to consume you and this garden. This is good night, surely, for you. What does that tell you about God? About God's heart for sinful and shameful Adam. Fearful and shameful Adam. Mercy. Mercy. Yes. Pardon? Counselor. Counselor. <laughs> yes, I like that, Sue. That's a great insight. Yes. It tells you something about God's love for Adam in his miserable state of fear and shame and hiding. God in his love asked a question designed to coax Adam out from his hiding place so Adam could stand before God with everything revealed. Remember Hebrews 4? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharp on the intelligent sword, dividing the sun of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, so that everything might be exposed before him with whom we have to do. That question was designed to get Adam out from behind his tree, and he comes out, you know, with his silly little fig leaves on. You see? That he just, see, verse 8, fig leaves, right? He comes out with his silly little fig leaves on that he and his wife are stitched together in a mad hurry before God comes along because he can't let God find them naked, can we? And, 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 and he pulls them out from behind the tree and there he is standing. This pathetic apology for a man. This one who was the apex of God's creation. Just a little lower than the angels. And there he stands, full of shame, full of fear, And God loves him. God asks him a question designed to expose his heart so that God could minister grace, forgiveness and love to that wicked heart. So God could take the shame and the fear and pour in his love and grace and mercy and forgiveness into that heart. Isn't that fantastic? Now, see, that's what us sons of daughters and sons of Adam and daughters of Eve are called on to do. To do the very same thing. For those in the body of Christ who are caught up in fear and shame. To invite them, coax them, invite them out to stand with us before the throne of grace that they might receive mercy in time of need. You see, it's the, uh, it's the passive man that hides behind the tree. You see there, Adam's sin was to eat. Uh, see in verse uh, 6. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. You see the passivity there in verse 6, Adam's passivity? He was there. He was there with her, the passage says. So he's standing there next to his wife, listening to the conversation she's having with the serpent. Can you believe that? He's just standing there passively, silent, saying nothing, doing nothing, while she has this conversation. So, the Satan tempts her, she takes the fruit, takes a bite, this is nice, pass it to her husband, he takes a bite, and all hell breaks loose. Adam's passivity and Adam's sin, what does the passive man do when his sin is exposed? He looks for somewhere to hide. And God comes looking for his man. Where are you, Peter? Where are you hiding, Peter? Come out from your hiding place, Peter, so I can pour my love and my grace 
into your poor befuddled heart and you be, can become the man that I created Eden for. That's the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. The man that I created Eden for. That's God's intention, isn't it? You see, when he drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, he placed the cherubim with the flaming swords at the entrance to the garden. That's what Adam should have done. God placed a sword on Adam's hand to protect the garden, to protect his wife, to keep Satan out. Adam could have taken up that sword and if he thought he needed help he could have called on 10,000 cherubim with flaming swords to stand there with him. That's the kind of power that God had given him as an image bearer, as the vice regent of creation. Instead he dropped his sword and he stood there and he allowed fear and shame to overwhelm him and passivity has been the curse of men ever since. We will not step forward. We look for places to hide. Our wife's angry with us, we look for somewhere to hide. Our children are out of control, we look for somewhere to hide. The boss gives us a challenge at work, we look for somewhere to hide. Why do we do that? Well, we're filled with fear that maybe I won't perform. Maybe I'll fail. And then after the fear and the failure will come the shame. Don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to be an elder. Don't ask me to teach Sunday school. Don't ask me to lead my wife and family. See, if I stay passive, I can stay out of trouble and no one will have any problems with me. Where are you, Peter? God will come. God comes after the passive man. Come out from behind that tree. I have a wonderful mandate for you that will thrill your manly soul. So, we ask questions that extend and surface hard issues. Uh, let's go to another example in Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> Here's a question that Jesus asked. Jesus asked lots of questions of people. chapter 10, at the end of the chapter, beginning of verse 46, Jesus has an encounter with a blind beggar. At, uh, in Jericho, the gates of Jericho. And in verse 47, uh, when he, that is the blind beggar, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What was the mercy there that Bartimaeus was looking for, do you think? Money Pardon? Pardon when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What do you think he wanted from Jesus? Get his sight back. Get his sight back. I think a blind beggar would probably, if he heard that the miracle worker was just about to pass by, he had, the miracle worker was in the crowd. That's what he'd want. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. Jesus will always hear the cry of a blind beggar, even above the noise and clamor of a multitude of voices. He will always hear the cry of a blind beggar. And so he said, Call him. So the crowd who had been rebuking him a moment ago, they called the blind man and said, Cheer up! On your feet, he's calling you. What were the crowd expecting at that point? What would they have been expecting? A miracle. Goody, goody. We're going to get a miracle. whoop de doo Jesus is here, we've got a blind beggar, we've got a miracle worker, we're going to see a miracle. Get on your feet, come quick, come quick. We want Jesus to heal you so we can, <laughs> we can say we saw it, we were there when it happened. You see, so cheer up, you know, things are just turned around. And so they bring him over and you can imagine blind Bartimaeus, you see he's blind, been blind since birth. And, and all these hands are grabbing him and dragging him towards Jesus and they're pushing and they're shoving and they're shouting and, and he doesn't know what's going on. 
Where are they taking him? He threw his cloak aside and jumped to his feet and came to Jesus with the help of the crowd. Verse 51. <laughs> Jesus asks him a question. What do you want me to do for you? Um, well, Jesus was probably a bit ignorant of what Bartimaeus wanted. And so Jesus' own knowledge had to be supplemented by Bartimaeus' answer. Jesus wasn't quite sure what Bartimaeus wanted, so he wanted to find out. So he knew then which way to proceed and how to operate and what to do next. Help me here, Bartimaeus. I'm not sure what to do in this situation. What do you want? Don't ask for anything too hard. What do you want? Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Jesus asked him a question. What do you want me to do for you? And you can imagine the crowd or the disciples saying, we've got a whole day's journey ahead of us. We've got to get to Jerusalem before day's end. We can't be caught out on the Jericho Road at night time because there's thieves and robbers. Let's get going here, Jesus. If you're going to heal them, heal them and let's get going. If you're not going to heal them, let's just get going. What's this, what's this questioning? What's this conversation you're having with them? What are these extending questions you're asking him? So why did Jesus ask the question? To, to me it was to show Bartimaeus that he kept him as a person and he was valued his opinion and that what he wanted not. He wasn't just someone he could heal just to please the crowd and move on. Okay. He wasn't someone Jesus was just going to use. He was also trying to solicit faith from him. I don't know why he was asking. He was obviously, I guess, challenging him to sort of have faith in Jesus. Okay, to express faith. Okay. Bartimaeus said, um, I want to see. Rabbi, I want to see. If you put the finger of one hand on verse 51 and take the finger of your other hand and put it on verse 36, what do you find? Very similar question. Word for word in my translation. Word for word. Word for word. You see, and what's happening in John 36? Somebody tell me. In verse 36, what's going on there? Well, that's when those disciples are squabbling over who's going to be Jesus' right and left. And they come and ask him for the question, I'm going to put their mother with them in this one, but they do in Matthew's one, I think. I'm going to be the first in the kingdom. And uh, so Jesus asked them the question, what do you want me to do for you? And what was their response? Greatness. Yes. Give me the power, give me the glory at your right hand. The power and the glory. So there he is, you see, there's Jesus asking this question of the sons of thunder. And the sons of thunder come with the answer, we want the power and we want the glory. A few verses later, Jesus is asking the same question of a blind beggar. What do you want me to do for you? Same question. And the blind beggar says, Rabbi, I want to see. Now, standing around Jesus were the sons of thunder and the rest of the disciples. You see? They hear Jesus ask the question of the blind beggar. And the sons of thunder go, hmm, just a few verses earlier, he asked us the same question. Same question, different answer. I want the power and the glory. I just want to see. And what was Jesus' answer to Bartimaeus? Your faith has made you whole. Why did Jesus ask the question of the blind Bartimaeus, the blind beggar? Why did he ask that question? For whose sake did he ask that question? Exactly. He knew that Bartimaeus had faith. He didn't have to question that. He knew he was going to heal Bartimaeus. There's no question about that. He asked the question of the beggar so that the disciples would examine their own hearts because the sons, of, the sons of thunder were the blind beggars. Bartimaeus is the one who had full sight. 
Who really was blind on the Jericho road? It wasn't Bartimaeus, was it? It was the sons of thunder. Back in Mark chapter 8, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, You are blind, every one of you. You see, the sons of thunder should have come to Jesus and said, We want to see. Help us to see. They were really the blind beggars. Bartimaeus was the man of faith. You see how Jesus used the question to expose the hard issues? To expose the hard issues in Bartimaeus, to expose the hard issues in James and John. Questions that extend, that extend the conversation beyond what she had spontaneously into the hard issues. The thing that's so interesting about this is the fact that you don't sense any shame in the sons of thunder in their answer. I mean, you know, they're probably now, the, you know, that's all been written down in the pages of history ever since, but there's no sense in which they <coughs> thought, oops. Brazen, wasn't it? Yeah, they sort of didn't suddenly go, oops, that really didn't show a very nice picture of my heart in that particular answer. There's almost no evidence of any kind of ability to self-reflect, to know the state of their own hearts. So Jesus takes the opportunity of blind Bartimaeus to, to challenge them, to reflect on their own hearts. Well, that's what these questions do. You see, they encourage the speaker to reflect on their heart issues. <coughs> well, can you think of any other examples in Scripture where God or Jesus asked questions of people? About the woman... Um he was caught in, in, in sin. Um, and Jesus asked where her husband was. I think you're getting confused with the woman at the well, aren't you? Yeah, the woman at the well. He asked the woman at the well um, to go and bring your husband. That's right. So it wasn't a question, really. It was more like a request. What's that? <laughs> Any other examples of questions that you can think of? When Jesus asked, her, who, who do you think, who am I? Who do you think I am? That's right. He asked his disciples, who do you think I am? Because remember the crowd was saying, are you the prophet? Are you John the Baptist come back to life? Are you Elijah? Then he turned to his disciples and said, who do you think I am? That's very good. Very good. See, he could have he could have used the occasion to turn to his disciples and give them a little sermon about who he was. Mm. But he asked a question. What was the purpose of the question, Sue? Oh, to bring out um, um, Peter answers, doesn't he? But you are the rock. Yes, that's that was the effect. Yes. But what was the purpose of the question? Well, to see in their hearts who they believed he was. Yes. To see, to, 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 to to surface the extent of their understanding. Mm. And, and, you know, here's the shame and the fear again. You see, a question like that, who do you think I am? You know, who's going to be brave enough to answer the question? Who's going to be brave enough to put it out there and see if they're right and, and, and uh, see if they've got it right? It's, it, it exposes the heart. And Peter got it right. He pulled it off at that time. Well, you, as you read through the scriptures, just be... A, just have an eye out for questions that God is asking and that Jesus is asking. And just think about uh, the fact that they ask questions of us. Designed to surface, designed to get us to reflect on our hard issues. And um, see how that happens for you. Okay, so that's where we're going tonight. We're talking about the red questions, the red arrows, designed to extend the conversation in the direction of hard issues. I've got two cautions here at the bottom of the page about this type of questioning. <clears throat> the first caution is, while well, exploration questions are very necessary, such questioning can often test the strength of the counseling relationship or of any relationship. Why do you think that would be the case? Why might you think that would be the case? You see, last week 
This questioning was relatively benign, wasn't it? The compassionate questioning was relatively benign. You know, we're just clarifying the words that have already been spoken, that the speaker has willingly spoken. We've just clarified those. But here, you see, we're kind of... What? What, what, what could be... What are we doing here that could test the relationship? Well, you're asking them to give more of themselves. I mean, they could have been throwing out the first lot of information almost to test the water to see how you'd respond, and then they've got to decide whether they're prepared to let more go. Come out from behind the tree. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on why that would be the case? Or frustrate, frustrate them into, um, or push them into revealing when they're not ready. Okay. Right. Might be a time issue. Yes. They don't want to get trampled by a swine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, when you put it out there, people can trample on you. It's a bit risky, isn't it? Yeah, it's risky. Okay. So you want a bit of proof first that it's not so likely? It sounds like trust. They need to trust you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they might not think you're ready, or they might not be ready to hear themselves. <coughs> right. They might not be able to face their own heart. Very good. <coughs> yes. Yes. You might ask someone, well, just how angry were you? On a scale of 1 to 10, how angry were you? And they might say, a little bit 10, well, probably a number 9. And so you might ask, well, if I was a fly on the wall, what would I see your number 9 anger? What would it look like? What would I see? What would I hear if I was a fly on the wall at that time? And suddenly, there's a question designed to get out on the table all the details about their anger. See, that could be pretty scary, couldn't it? As, as a, someone comes to you and they struggle with watching pornography. So you start to ask them some extending questions. Well, how often? How often do you go to the computer? When you do, how long do you, st you spend there? And, and what, do you, uh, what kind of pornography do you watch? And get some details. Is it, is it this or is it that? Is it soft or is it hard pornography? See, and, and, and you know, it's not easy questions to answer, are they? They just happen to put out there, well, I struggle with pornography and they're hoping you'd just leave it at that. And you'd say something like, well, I'll pray for you. But now you're asking some extending questions. You see, it, it tests the relationship. So that's my first caution. That's why we have to, that's why we have first taken time to listen, active listening, and compassionate questioning. Um, we've taken time to listen and respond in ways that begin to establish the relationship with the seeker. Thus we will gain permission, I've got that inverted commas there, permission or the right to ask exploring questions. So I, my first caution is don't jump in with these <laughs> in the first conversation. You see, active listening comes first, compassionate questioning. The compassionate questioning brings the speaker to the point where they know that you're committed to hearing and understanding What's going on for them in that situation? You're beginning to build trust. You're beginning to build relationship. To be able to do questions that extend. Here's the second caution. These questions may surface hidden thoughts and feelings, leaving the seeker feeling quite exposed and vulnerable and unsure of your intentions. What are you going to do with this information? After you find out the extent of his pornography habit, or the extent of his or her anger, and the details of the anger, what are you going to do with that information? They don't know, you see, they, they need to be reassured, confidentiality and so on. This is where love can be powerfully communicated. A strong affirmation of your commitment to them at this point of the process may be necessary in order to keep them engaged with further exploration. Okay, any, any comments you'd like to make about those two cautions? Is it likely at, at this point that, um, well, around this point, they might want you to give up something too? You know, if, if you're on a fairly mutual, have a fairly mutual relationship, you know, they've given up something, so they might ask you some personal questions too. You know, to see how much you're willing to share. <laughs> okay, well, could you give us an example? Um, 
really. <laughs> Not a specific one. Um, I just mean that if you're um, seeking to help someone and you're, you're asking them questions and, and they're telling you more and more, and then at the end of the conversation they say, well, how's, how's, did such and such work out in your life? You know, what, what, what came of that? And, uh, and so they almost wanted something back. It's a something reciprocal. Yeah. Yes. They want something on you. If you're going to yeah. have something on them, they want <laughs> something on you. Crudely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, but it, it's kind of just developing trust a little bit on, on the end. Yes. Very good. Uh, and I could see what Michael's saying. I could see that happening, for instance, in, a, in the sort of conversation you might have um, um, with someone after church over a cup of tea. The, um, and you might say, you know, how are things going this week? And they might say, well, look, you know, not too well. So what was the problem? Well, I had a, had a blazing row with my husband this week. And then they might say, do you ever have disagreements with your husband? So that's the sort of thing, you see? You know, before I say any more, I just want to be sure that, that you too struggle in this area so that you're not going to be judging me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it can be very helpful then for, for you to acknowledge that yes, you have struggles, you have conflict with your spouse, and sometimes it's a real struggle to resolve them. But as you do that, you're not wanting to follow the green arrow, are you? See, you're going to want it to bring it back to what uh, they initially shared. And um, sometimes they, they, those questions can almost lead to put you off the scent. Um, I suppose the wrong, but the idea, you know, that it can either be a distractor in the sense of trying to take the attention off of themselves if they feel like they're getting, it's getting too close. I mean, I've had a situation where I was talking to somebody and they were sharing about a, a family situation there, and then at the end of it, he said, "Oh." Uh, well, how's your family? I suppose you don't have any problems or issues with and you never know whether that's a, I'm just sort of taking, deflecting this or whether it's um, I, are you going to genuinely engage with me on, on an honest level as well? So you never quite know with those questions, but it can happen. It's very good and you, you may suspect that that's what's happening. You may even make an assumption that that's what's happening. <laughs> and, and so you could test that by saying, well look, uh, um, I'd be happy to talk to you about, you know, the struggles that we have in our marriage, but um, you, you did mention a struggle that you were having. Is this something you'd like to talk to, talk uh, with me about right now? So you've tested that assumption to see if that, in fact, is the motive of their questioning. And they might say, hmm, I don't think so, or I'd be glad to, or something in between. In the context of a Christian community, yes, um, we're encouraging and counselling each other like it's Yes. So relationships built over time can be directed one way at one, and the next conversation might be the right. right. other way around. Right. Right. Could be on similar subjects or similar. Yes. Subjects. So that's that's right. And who knows where that might lead? See, that might lead to the four of you getting together and just just talking about some of the difficulties you have in your marriage and just praying for one another and encouraging one another. Mm -hmm. See, it just might lead to something like that. And that was, that was one of the helpful things that came out of that article of Ed Welch, I think it was, uh, it was talking about, um, we asked that question about when's that fad of counselling going to run its course sort of thing, and then he seeks to answer that question, and he just made that, and that's an interesting point between the secular model and the Christian model, is that it's not a professional relationship that just forms for the sake of dealing with the problem, but it's in the context of a family relationship and the relationship is mutual and as Ian said it might be you, you, you know iron sharpens iron you might be the one encouraging them at this stage and they might be the ones who helps you encourages you in the future so it's not quite the same you know I sit down people teacher counsellor counsellee type situation all the time that's right and, and, and that won't end until Jesus comes back so what we're doing here, you see here in, the, in this course, we're kind of trying to hold two things in the air at the same time. We're, we're not only talking about uh, uh, developing the ability to have a mutual ministry of encouragement one to another in the body of Christ. We are talking about that. But we're also talking about the situation where as leaders or as pastors or as elders or as shepherds or as small group leaders, 
you are in a position to actually uh, take the initiative and start a conversation with someone who is struggling with something. So it may happen in the first one more mutually and spontaneously, and, my, and in the second one it might happen as you fulfill a shepherding role in someone's life and actually self-consciously step into their world and into their life and into their heart with a procedure like this in the back of your mind. Incidentally there was a, um, a, a situation where um, slightly different, it was with non-Christians, but there was a couple that I knew who said to me once that they're having real trouble witnessing to their non-Christians because their non-Christians were just so pagan and, and they live such pagan lifestyle and one thing they, this couple were always doing was fighting and, and yelling, they'd go into their backyard and yell and scream at each other and, and my friends just over the fence could hear them and, and uh, they, they didn't quite know what to do with all of that because these people just sounded so wild and and so I said to them, uh, my Christian friend, I said, well, do you guys ever uh, fight and argue? He said, well, yeah, we do. I said, where do you go to have your arguments? Well, we go into our bedroom and shut the door. I said, why do you do that? Well, so the kids can't hear us. Well, why do you do that? Uh, you're not supposed to ask why questions. So, you know, what's the purpose? There we go. What's the purpose in doing that? <laughs> you see? And they say, well, uh, um, uh, uh, it wouldn't do our kids any good to hear us argue and only discourage them and, and we want to be a good witness, we want to be a good role model to our children. So you can see that's full of flaws right there, can't you? How will the children ever learn to resolve conflict in their own marriages if they don't see you resolving it before them? But anyway, that's by the by. And so I said to them, well, um, here's my suggestion. Next time you guys have an argument, go out into the backyard and scream and yell at each other in your loudest of voices. <laughs> And then, next time you see your neighbour, you say to your neighbour, I'm sorry you had to hear that. You would have heard me and my wife going for it the other night. And you might say to your neighbour, do you have those kind of struggles? <laughs> <laughs> see, an extending question based on a mutuality that's been established. You see, and then, and then you can talk about, well, you know, we really have struggles and, you know, you might say something like, you know, the Bible's really helped us or something. But it, see, it gets, it gets a conversation going, doesn't it? Based on that idea of mutuality, a shared struggle. So coming back to the Christian community, you know, one believer, one beggar showing another beggar where to find food. And, and, and that's, you know, in, in Hebrews 4, you know, let us... Let us go to the throne of grace that we might receive help in time of need. There's that mutuality. What do you think about that? What do you think about my advice to that Christian couple? Well, that's the trouble with giving advice. It's never right, is it? <laughs> Was I a bit... Would I overstep the mark there? Sue looked a bit horrified. <laughs> Her pastor would never advise that. <laughs> I don't know, they wouldn't forget it though. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can reflect on that. Yeah. It wouldn't be easily forgotten, so they might not actually do that, but they might think, hmm, we shouldn't hide out. Maybe we argue so badly that's why we hide it, but maybe we are no better than our neighbours. It establishes a mutuality. Yes, we all struggle to live in a fallen world. We all struggle to stay happily married. Well, perhaps not if you're newly married. Okay, any other thoughts about, uh, about extending questions before we move on to the practical stuff of what kind of questions? Do you know the kind of questions I'm talking about here? So, you know, where, where, where have you had experience with, um, with asking people these kinds of questions that move a conversation into the hard issues? Or is this all um, foreign territory? We're now moving into territory which is unknown to all of us because this hasn't been our experience. You see, quite often this is where we camp, isn't it? We camp right here and we try to be good listeners and, and we don't really know how to respond so we just stay listening, which is fine. But here, you see, the, the passive man is moving. 
passive men and angry women. The evangelical church is full of passive men and angry women. They're so angry that their husbands refuse to move. And the husbands, full of fear and shame, looking for somewhere to hide. And their wives come after them. Oh, man. Oh. It's, it's endemic. Okay. Can I just ask yes, a question? This may be way off the track, but I'm just got this this struggle, a little bit of a struggle. Um, is there ever a place to to stand up and say to someone, "No, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, this is what's right," and and to actually contradict completely what they're saying, and and actually hold up the banner of truth and and or well, the mirror of the word, reflect yeah, it back to them. Yeah. And it, it's quite confrontational, but or is it just a different kind of a conversation? I'm going to be to step forward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, your answer to your question is yes, but we're not there yet. Right. <laughs> See, we're 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 getting there. Um, another part of that answer to that question would be. You have to be pretty sure that what they're doing is sinful. See, it may be they're just doing something which is something that you would never do. Um, it may be that it is. Um, like I, I was talking to a guy who really struggled with internet porn and I just said to him, flat out, get rid of the computer. I didn't wait for him to come to that conclusion, he probably wouldn't have. So, I mean, imagine living without a computer, that's pretty inconvenient. But he did, he tossed the computer. He got rid of it. And immediately, immediately he was in a position where we were able to talk further about, we were able to continue down here, you see. This was up here. Get rid of the computer. Now we're able to, it's a bit like saying to an alcoholic, quit drinking and then we can talk. So you can't, you can't counsel a bottle. You can't counsel someone who's hooked on pornography. So, you know, get rid of the computer. It's a bit like you're saying. This is very upfront, very direct, very authoritative, very, this is what you must do. And then stop watching porn and then we can talk about the issues, the hard issues, yeah. So all that has to be behind what you're saying there, the, the commitment to them to explore, stay with them and explore hard issues. Well, you might, it might be a group of people you face with them. And an issue raised, and and you get a tomorrow issue, and you say you guys are way off track. That that's not right. Well, if, well, if it's a moral issue, then we're on pretty sure ground, aren't we? Mm. Yes. I mean, obviously, moral sin has to be confronted. But yeah, a lot of people. Are you, sorry, are you thinking of a particular situation? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> he says, getting a bit nervous. No, but I, I, I can picture that, that kind of situation where, you know, it, sometimes if you if you hear some workmates or something talking about an issue and, and you're wondering whether you should step in because you know you're going to isolate yourself, you know you're going you're gonna to pitch a fence between you and your workmates and how helpful is that going to be if you're seeking to counsel them and, and otherwise, you know. It's that... Kind of principle. Oh right. Oh well, thank you. That helps me to understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking to a group of non-Christians, um, by all means, you can um, you can lovingly let them know where you stand on moral issues. Definitely, you can say, "Look, I don't, you know, I don't like these jokes about women that you guys are telling. I don't find them at all amusing. They're a little somewhat offensive." Um, and if you feel the need to, you can follow that up with, "But I really like you guys, and I value the relationship, and you know, and." want to stay connected with you or use words that are appropriate for the mm. people you're talking to. See, so you're making a stand, distinctive, but you're showing a commitment to the relationship. Mm. Grace and truth, love and truth. Okay. Um, yes, that's, that's very, uh, it's a very non-passive thing for you to do and to be highly applauded. But I think, oh, were you going to say that, something? Yeah, in? It's the... I think people don't take it well when we tell them don't do that or you shouldn't because they usually probably already know it at a certain level. But because in their history, the people that have told them that 
haven't committed to an ongoing relationship. Like it's just you need to do this, and then it's kind of see you later, or I'll get back to you when you change, rather than I'm still walking with you. Because if they do actually want to change, they're going to need help. Are you prepared to be there in all the mess of helping them? Most people aren't. Very good, very good. And and if we could. Uh, just look at that up here. We could we could we could divide this up into uh, grace and truth. And in other words, we're going to take the time here to build a relationship that's strong enough to bear the weight of truth, bear the weight of gospel truth. But there may be times when you have to do it around the other way, and like you said. You know, it could be the internet thing or it could be if somebody in your church is shacked up with somebody and there's an eldership you have to go and visit them and tell them that's right. But then the issue is you then extend the grace and saying, hey, look, there's obviously some issues here of your heart issue that as to why you're feeling the need to satisfy yourself in this way. You know, we're committed to helping you work with that issue. So at one level you're saying you've got to stop doing this, but we recognise it's a heart issue and we want to go the journey with you. I think that's right. When it comes to moral issues, sexual issues, we can be pretty sure about our ground and what God wants, and we can be upfront about that. Um, and as you say, remain committed to this process. Uh, in, in many situations in the body of Christ, it won't be those kind of issues that you confront. It may be if you're an elder or a pastor, but uh, just in the general, um, uh, among the flock, among the sheep themselves, it'll be issues more like, more like relational issues, uh, conflict or misunderstanding in relationships. Like we had a... Um, situation recently where uh, a woman came with the morning tea only to find that someone else had bought the morning tea, they got the order, the, the roster out of order and she'd gone all this trouble and here was her morning tea and someone else had got their fears with the morning tea and she just lost her rag completely. Toys thrown out of the cot like you wouldn't believe. And we are able to mollify her and say look we can take your food and put it in the freezer and we can use it next week. Thank you for doing morning tea for next week. See what well, those are the kind of things which, see, in the body of Christ, you, you go through a process like this. Now, I don't know where the sin is. I don't know what's going on in her heart. Somebody's driving that, but somebody needs to be able to do this with her. Did you have your, do you want to say something? Well, I was just thinking, isn't it true also, even if there is some blatant, like, moral wrong or something, like, especially with an non-Christian, sometimes maybe, like, it's a secondary issue and you'll never see the real heart issue if you just harp on that. Like, if I meet someone, you know, is living with a boyfriend or whatever. And if I just look past that and, like, love her and get to know her and stuff, then maybe if she comes to the Lord, like, she'll see that that's wrong. But right. I just say, maybe if you build up grace first, then she'll see the truth and see her own error rather than just correcting her. Yes, if you feel the need with non-Christians to... Uh, um, rebuke them about moral sin, immoral sin. You're just going to have to reckon on the fact that you'll probably lose the relationship. That you may still go ahead, and that may still be the right thing to do. But you can't expect non-Christians to live like Christians. Mm. Remember, they're 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 dead in their sins. It's like John Calvin said: it's like the donkey at the opera. They have no idea. They're clueless as to what you're on about, as to why you should be upset by that, or why God, whoever he is, should be upset by that. In some situations, too, it would, it would depend how they're affecting other people. Like if they were putting the children or something at risk, you don't have time to go through a process while, you know, with that. It's just like, this is it. You mean like something like child abuse? Yeah, well, or even just an angry person or something. Or a violent person. Yeah, so it's kind of like this is the line, and you tell it for us. There's no, you know. Yep. I think this is showing the place of wisdom, isn't it? Because you got all the situation. I mean, there's the, the, these are the sort of principles, but the reality is, you're dealing with a Christian and non-Christian. You know, what's your relationship with them? And are they just a new Christian? A whole lot of things. So. Yes, if you're dealing with an angry and violent man, mm -hmm. then uh, you know. Uh, Remember, this whole course is built around encouraging one another in the body of Christ. And it's, it's, it's not likely you're going to find a lot of these issues that you've been talking about here tonight. 
So the model isn't necessarily easily transferable to those extreme issues. A variation of the model could well be. Let's have a break. Okay, here we go. Page two, what kind of questions will explore and extend? <clears throat> two kinds of questions. First of, all, first of all, questions that are specifically centered on the seeker's experience of their situation. Here's this lady. <clears throat> she's come home from the supermarket. She had this encounter with this person from church, which didn't go well, and she's left confused and not sure what to do next. What would be some questions, extending questions, you could ask her that would focus on her experience of the situation rather than on the situation itself? Questions that focus on the situation itself are these questions. Clarifying questions, reflect back questions on the situation itself. These questions are on her experience of the situation. Okay, What are some questions you could ask her about her experience of that situation? Okay, how did it make you feel? Okay. What was the first thing that popped into your mind when it happened to you? Okay. Okay. Okay, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? Okay. I don't know what the question would be, but I guess you might probe just to find out whether that's the. Is that sort of out of the blue for their relationship, or has there been some uh, some issues that have been bubbling away? So, what would the question be, Alistair? Um, well, I don't know. Is, it, is, is there anything I don't know happened in the relationship that might have upset? Well, I don't know. Do you think there might have, might have been any any reason for her to be upset with you or something? I don't know. Is there, I don't know. Well, well, those. Just try to probe. I don't know. Okay, well those are some questions which uh, have the effect of extending the conversation by asking her about her experiences with that woman. Now, you see, Alistair's question does run the danger of becoming a green question because now you're going to focus on a separate incident from the one that happened in the supermarket. So you'll be a bit careful there. You want to ask questions that focus on her experience of what happened in the supermarket. So you might ask something like, um, uh, was, was anyone else there at the time that witnessed what went on there? Why would you ask a question like that? Uh, yeah, possibly, yes. Or perhaps shame if it was, this took place in a public place. And was she feeling any shame about all this going down when, you know, she came along expecting to have a nice conversation with this lady and it all went bottoms up and she doesn't really know why. And so you might ask a question like that to see if exploring a hard issue for shame. Uh, you might ask a question like, um, uh, when, when, you, uh, when you first met uh, the lady at the supermarket, your friend from church, uh, what were you expecting when you met her and you started conversing? What were you expecting from that encounter? Why would you ask a question like that? Well, I guess it might bring up if she thought there was any prior history that might negatively have impacted upon their meeting, or if the other person might have had any reason to be miffed with her or anything. Uh, yeah, possibly. It wasn't what I was thinking, but it could well be. Could well be. What? Just her expectations of the relationship. Her expectations of that encounter. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you want to know about those expectations? Why would that be an important extending question? What she's expecting affects how she's going to feel. If, I mean, how off base what happened actually is from where she. If those expectations aren't realised, she'll be left feeling something. Disappointed, regretful, angry. You see, a question like that leads her into reflecting on how is she dealing with her disappointment that it didn't turn out the way she hoped. 
You see how those are questions designed on her experience of the situation. You're not looking for more facts about that situation or related situations. You're focusing in on her experience of that situation. What was going on in her heart? What did she believe? What did she feel? What was she convinced of? This will begin to define the hard issues associated with their struggle, thus providing both seeker and helper with insight into the inner workings of the heart, the seat of the motivations. Now this is difficult work. You thought active listening was difficult. You wait till you start trying to come up with questions that focus on their experience of the situation. You might say something like, um, that sounds very difficult, that's a statement. That, that sounds like it was a very difficult situation for you. Is, is, that, is that how you felt at the time? And she will might say, well, yes, it was. And so you ask her, uh, Mark's question, well, what were some of the things you were feeling? Now, that's a fairly pointed and obvious question, extending question, designed to get to her experience of the situation. At this stage, you're not interested in the history of their relationship. You're not interested in how past encounters have gone. That will possibly come later. Right now, you're interested in her experience of the situation. Why? Because you want to surface some hard issues. You want to surface some hard issues. Now, as those hard issues are surfaced, as those feelings of disappointment are surfaced, or feelings of anger, or feeling of shame, or feeling of guilt, or feeling of helplessness, or feelings of confusion, as she thinks about it in the course of the afternoon, what she's doing now is laying herself bare before you, laying the emotions of her heart bare before you, and you're right there as a compassionate questioner and active listener as those emotions are laid bare. And now you're connecting with her. If you're your husband, that's wonderful. If you're a Christian friend, that's wonderful too. You're connecting with her at the level of her shame and fear. You see, you're, these questions are drawing her out from where she's hiding. Okay, so questions that center specifically on the seeker's experience of their situation. Secondly, um, oh yes, our concern here with these extending questions, not necessarily with gaining more information, that was done in the act of listening and responding. Previous two lectures, act of listening and responding. Secondly, open-ended questions. Closed questions often require a yes or no answer. Um, has this ever happened in your relationship with this lady before? No. <laughs> Where do you go with that? See, it's a closed question. A closed question is a terminal question. An open-ended question is an invitational question. A closed question will terminate the conversation. An open-ended question will invite further conversation. A closed question often requires a yes or no answer and will provide information rather than insight. They are terminal, not invitational questions. There may be times when a closed question is needed to gather information such as how many jobs have you had in the last two years? Where do you come in your family birth order? Those kind of questions. Too many closed questions, however, will prevent the development of the conversation. No more than two closed questions together is a good guide. So, uh, <coughs> you're uh, talking to this lady who's had this encounter in the supermarket during the day. What are some open-ended questions that you could ask her? Getting too late at night? Long drive back to Hamilton? Well, uh, what were you feeling? That's an open-ended question. That's a question that can't be replied to with a yes or a no. An open-ended question like that, what were you feeling, actually requires her to think about what she was feeling and then try to put that into words. 
In other words, it's an invitation to keep the conversation going at a heart level. Open-ended questions facilitate the development of the conversation by extending the ideas already shared rather than introducing new ones. See these, uh, these red lines are extending the ideas already covered by the blue lines, the blue arrows. The blue arrows are the, the questions to clarify and to reflect back. And now the red arrows are extending that information. It's not new information. This is not data gathering. We're not introducing new ideas. We're extending the ideas already shared. They're invitational questions rather than agenda setting questions. If you ask a question like, have you ever had an experience like this before with this lady? Now that's not a question that focuses on her experience of the situation. It's a, a data gathering question. And uh, if she says yes, then you might ask her questions about that and you end up talking about a previous situation. Now all that can be very important in order to establish a pattern in the relationship, particularly if you get to the point at the end of this process, if you get to the point where you're in a position to reconcile these two women, to be a loyal yoke fellow and help these two women to agree and, and, and to get together with these two women and to talk about that situation and it would be helpful to know about the pattern of the relationship. And um, uh, so those questions could well be necessary down the track. But if you're interested in hard issues, if you're interested in hard issues, then um, you won't be seeking to uh, introduce new ideas or new topics. You won't be asking questions that set the agenda beyond the experiences that have been shared. Open-ended questions so the seeker that you are tracking with them, staying with them without falling behind or running ahead. Open-ended questions can include how often, what, where, could you expand on that, what did you mean when you said, what else did you feel, what have I missed, could you help me to understand what you're feeling, at the, what you were feeling at that moment? Can you tell me a bit more about that? What are some other open-ended questions you could add to that list? What do you think will happen next? Okay. Is there another one? What are you afraid of? Ah, that's a better question. What do you think will happen next is kind of a data gathering. What are you afraid might happen next? Or what are you afraid might happen next time you see her at church? Okay. What about some more? What about some other open-ended questions we could add to that list? While you're thinking about that, I'll set the chairs up. Okay, what was, what was your immediate reaction? About how do you feel about your response? How do you feel about your response? Uh, Ian, just coming back to your one. What was your immediate reaction, or what did you immediately think? Um, now, we're trying to get down to hard issues, so maybe instead of think, you could put feel. 
what was your immediate feeling? What did you, what emotion or what thing did you immediately feel at the time? How do you feel about your response? Why would that be a good question to ask? Okay. They're probably not happy about the whole situation and they're probably not happy about what, how they've handled it. That's why it's bugging them. If you were to say to them, do you feel any shame or guilt as a result of that encounter, they, they might find that a very difficult question to answer. But if you were to ask a question like, uh, like that one, how do you feel about your response? You see, that, that gets them thinking about that kind of opens the door for them to look at those deeper emotions, more painful emotions, and um, can advance the conversation in that direction. <coughs> okay, who would like to come and uh, uh, for the role model here uh, tonight as I seek to demonstrate extending questions? Who's keen to know the next instalment on Ian's situation at work? <laughs> <laughs> Ian's not. <laughs> Any volunteers? We have a very nice chair up here. It's strong, it's attractive. It's nicely Good. covered. <laughs> or it can be made up. Tell me about your wonderful husband. Just make something up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the wonderful husband that's made up? Oh, good on you, Sue. Just any issue. You can make one up. Okay. I think it'll be sort of made up. Partly true and partly made up. It'll be fine. <laughs> Hello, Sue. It's nice to see you again. Yes, yes. What would you like to talk about today? Um, well, it's quite difficult to talk about really because it's not something I would normally talk to anyone about apart from my husband. Mm, okay. Um, That's painful. Mm. That's a painful thing. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And it, it surfaces now and then and sometimes you know, I've prayed about it and want to get over it and it just issue just doesn't want to go away. Mm -hmm. um, we started to feel that we were being taken advantage of and um, and so things got a little little tear. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Then there was a, an unfortunate sort of a split in our church and conflict and oh, um, wow. yes, things being seen and we felt uncomfortable and and so um, we kept these, these people at a, at a distance. Um, and that I felt terrible about this because we should be quick to forgive. And, and the years have gone on and on and... Um, okay. Really got stuck in the situation. Mm. Oh, so you're feeling stuck with that relationship? I feel badly about it. Okay. Yes, because we we all belong to God, don't we? And we're all sinful and... Um, we are. But I just feel if I was to forgive them, then they'd want to be back in my life and it would be all the same difficulties again. Oh, right. So nothing would be resolved, basically. Right. Okay. And, and, and it sounds like, so you've been struggling with this for quite a while. Yes. And, and it kind of hasn't gone away. It's no, just kind of remained right. there. And you're not quite sure what to do with it all. Mm. Okay, and 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 so uh, now, as you think about it, mm. uh, it's been a it's been a while now since it all began. But now, as you think about it, what sort of what sort of things do you feel towards yourself and towards them? Well, still a sense of mistrust. Okay. And it's very difficult when you when you feel you've been ridiculed or. Um, very hurtful things said. It's, it's 
very difficult to have a sense of trust. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> well, uh, how do you, as you think about that situation now and feeling kind of stuck in it and, and uh, it kind of, um, it's not going anywhere, it's just kind of sitting there, mm. how, does that, how does that make you feel about yourself and about them? Um, I feel lousy about myself. I don't like this thinking, thinking in my head. Okay. About, and I have that um, if I were to come across them again, make a first step towards them, okay. a friendship or like getting to know them again is meeting them for the first time. Oh right, okay. But I make that first step. Okay. But the okay. opportunity hasn't arisen. Okay. So you're feeling, you're feeling uh, lousy I think is the word you used, about about this whole thing and how it kind of sits heavy on your heart and if you had the opportunity to see them again you'd like to start over, start afresh and if, it, if it's possible. Yes, mm. yes. And, and, had and I believe I should really trust God to make this work or resolve the heart. Um, right. Um, just the same. <laughs> So the lack of trust yes. and, and yes. the feeling being hurt and being sinned against. Yes. Okay. Okay. At the same time, knowing that I most likely hurt, hurt them too. Mm. So, so what would you what would you like to do about this situation? <laughs> Is that a hard one? Yes. What what what's hard about that question? Or that I don't idea? Know what to do about it. Yes. Well I have said that if I were to meet them again okay. I would try and make peace with them. Mm -hmm. To make peace with them. And that, would that or to make a first step towards right. and, reconciliation. And would that involve talking about the past and what's happened, or, or not? Oh, I just think probably the first step would be best just to be reasonably friendly. And okay. And what would be your hope? That where would things go from that first step? What would be your hope? What would be your desire? Um, well, if I, if I was really honest, don't really want to be friends with these people, but if before God, it's not right, and that's why I probably feel lousy. Oh right, okay. So you're in a bit of a quandary. <laughs> you, you don't want to be friends with them, but you think no. maybe you think maybe God might want you to be friends with them, and that puts you in a little bit of a dilemma. Mm. Yes. Wow, that sounds like that sounds really hard, particularly if it's been going on for a long time. Yes. It would be it would be um, it'd be good to know what what God wanted in all of this, wouldn't it? What 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 do you yes. think? What do you think God might want in all this? Well, I, I would right, right, mm. and there's plenty of evidence in the New Testament that that's what He would like. Yes. But as you as you think about that, and you think about where things are now, there's a bit of a gap. Yes. And and that looks like a pretty hard gap to get across. Right now, yes. Picked it with the history, yes. So does that mean you're kind of stuck? I mean, or is there something that that we can do to help move across that gap and get toward that desired goal? Well, I mean, I do know. <laughs> I God doesn't forgive people that don't repent. Does he require that of us? And, and perhaps perhaps forgiveness comes towards the end of that process to get to that goal. Maybe before that there needs to be a conversation about 
what you're forgiving them for and what they're acknowledging and what do you think about what do you think about that it sounds pretty scary yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm. what is it about that that would be scary for you mm. <laughs> <laughs> who are a lot nicer than them Well, that, yes, you're, you're right. That's a very difficult situation. It's not an uncommon situation for Christians to find themselves in. Mm. But it's very difficult, very painful, and not easily resolved. Mm. Mm, that's helpful. Yeah, not easily resolved. And, and if, if it's something that you, you, if that's a gap you'd like to address, and if you think I could help you address that, then I'd be very happy to talk to you again. Oh, thank you, Peter. It's very helpful to talk to someone. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so bye bye. Okay, you bunch of sinners. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see that was uh, that was good, and what was not good about that? In terms of tonight's lecture, did you purposely do something to me? That's just my sinful heart, Michael. <laughs> I think you, you picked up on the dilemma sort of thing, and the question you asked was what would be your hope or desire mm -hmm. from a first next step sort of thing. What would you hope to mm -hmm. achieve? What would the desire be to achieve? I thought that was a, a very good question because that made Sue really think, well, she's got she's in this dilemma, or we both are. <laughs> um, and, um, really makes you think, well, um, uh, you know, what, what in the way forward, is, or does it have to be a way forward in it all, and uh, you know, why, is it really a dilemma, and if, you, if you've got a particular desire to see something happen, then mm -hmm. it sort of helps you come out of it. It's the first step, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you pick up any questions that focused on Sue's experience of that situation? Were there any questions like that? Okay. What was your overall impression of that role play experience? Speaker and hearer. What's your overall impression? I, I always wondered, um, I mean I think, and I can't remember exactly how you got there, but I do think that you helped Sue to put her f finger on why there was a on this whole issue of dilemma which was going on in her mind and she was able to be very honest with herself about what, why there was a dilemma. Um, I don't know whether your use of here and here was intended to bring reality. I just wondered whether there was, it, hope was diminished in the sense that you almost, if for a season there, I'm sure you didn't mean to, but it almost seemed hopeless um, I think you turned it around a bit by the end, and you sort of talked a little bit, hey, bridge the thing. But I, I just wondered that, and, and um, with that, with the initially there was sort of a sense of, oh, you've got a big mountain to climb. And okay. maybe that's true. Maybe that's what you need. I don't know. That was just that. Okay, fair enough. Yep. But wasn't that reflecting where she's at? Because it would almost be to minimise it, maybe, if you were to say, like, if it was just a little gap, because to her it is huge. Okay. Okay. So it could be reflecting how Sue saw it. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I I thought that was good that picture. Okay. And all she right. could al I always said, Oh no, it's I don't think it's like that. Okay. So she that was kind of like mm. testing. Okay. We'll, we'll ask her in a minute if it was helpful or hopeful. Helpful or not helpful. Hopeless or was it? I mean, in that conversation, I mean, I, I, I sort of thought with this heart issues thing here, and I don't know whether you intended to go to gospel application, but I felt like getting onto the whole issue of reconciliation and you've gone beyond the scratching of the heart issues to sort of diving into the solution. And I wondered whether that had gone beyond your original brief. 
too. Yes. I thought you were just doing the hard yes. shoes. No, you're right. I did. You were driving it to I the did. solution, which was forgiveness and reconciliation. Yep. You're quite right. We were, we, we were down here. You're quite right. You asked the question, what would God want? Yep, it's going down there, yes. But I talked about what the scriptures said too, didn't I? I, I knew, as a Christian, I knew. Yes. You, you talked a lot about God. You brought God into it very early on, and you know what God wants, and that was part of the dilemma. You know what God yes. wants, and you know where you are. and So, yeah, God was in there. So, I mean, she probably forced your hand a bit in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that you could have answer, asked a question in there about to sort of saying what do you think needs to change before you can have genuine reconciliation or something like You that. mean change in Sue? Or well, change in, in the situation? Yeah, in the situation. Okay, that'd be a very good question. What do you think needs to change? Okay. Because that Sue had come to the... You had, you had brought her to the... Um, to the position where there was a... A gap, a bridge, right. A gap. And right. So right. And she felt she was stuck. Yeah. She used the word stuck. But that was where, as Alistair said, you, you began to speak truth, gospel okay. truth. Um, Naughty. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I could have stayed on this a bit longer and explored the heart issues further. Okay? Could have done that. I made a judgment call, but it seemed like Sue was wrestling with the whole where God fitted into all of this. So to a little bit extent, I was it was client centred. I was led by the where she what I felt she was going. I mean that's a good question. I mean doesn't that sort of beg the question though that you know you can have your five steps in mind, but if somebody's already ready and they're taking you exactly in sense, I mean it's a bit like you know when kids go to school. I mean if they can already read, you know you can either run them through the phonics program to death and bore them silly, <laughs> and they can already read, or you just go and straight and do whole language. I mean it's a bit yes. So you know in the role plays. You know, that's come a little bit closer to real life than a classroom lecture. It's not real life, but it's mm. getting a lot closer than a classroom lecture. And what we're finding is, in fact, the paradigms don't exactly work step by step, and they're not meant to. This is just in order to teach them, but uh, we'll find that, in fact, it's a matrix. Lynn, what was your, uh, sorry, Sue, what was your experience of the role play? Well, it was quite difficult things to talk about and bring mm. out, and you know, it, was, it was a bit embellished. That's um, fine. But it was almost a shock to, to have somebody respond like you did so well. And the way when you said it's not uncommon amongst Christians, that was like, whew. That was that was hopeful. hopeful that, yes. um, it was almost enough for like ten minutes of talking those hard things and then for you to say that's enough for this week or something like that. I felt quite relieved I didn't have to yes. go any further than that at that point. It was a pretty intense ten minutes, yes. wasn't it? So were you surprised at how quickly it became so intense? Or did you kind of expect it would? Yeah, I thought it would be. Okay. I was a bit quite nervous. Yes. My heart was going to get out. <laughs> As we talked, um, Sue, did your nervousness stay the same, increase or lessen? Uh, I think it increased, but it, it wasn't as lessened a lot when you understood what I was saying so well. Back. Okay. You know, the, the division and then it's very hard to Okay. And forgiveness, those are big things and you recognising how I was feeling. Right. And the and struggle. Putting words to the struggle. Yes. Okay. So eloquently. Yeah. And then and by universalizing it, you know, a lot of Christians find themselves in this situation in the body of Christ. That takes some of the catastrophe out of the whole thing. It's not quite as catastrophic. It's just, it's part and parcel of the struggle we all have living together in the body of Christ. Yeah, I think that's, that's almost a relief, I think, for some people. I think some of the dangers I'm when you hear people preach is it's almost kind of somebody's up there pounding out the, what, what the, the reality is supposed to be, but they're not very hopeful because they don't come across as we're all fellow strugglers in this, and this is why we're here today. It's kind of... 
try harder to do better. Yeah, that's right. This is the standard. You've got to meet it, and there's a feeling that, oh, I've got one struggling with this, I'm the only one. And if I told somebody else, crikey, boy, the opinion of me would drop. And you see, Sue, Sue took a big risk tonight. You know, what she had to say, another Christian could very easily jump right in and condemn her for that, couldn't they? Oh, you've got an unforgiving spirit. You let it drag on too long. All that kind of stuff. Um, which would have totally crushed her spirit. But you see tonight, just a little bit of a toe in the water. You know, can I talk about this? Can anything good happen out of this? Can we get unstuck here in any way? And You see, it's the beginning of something that could be very, very helpful. Ian, what, what was your impression of my conversation with your wife? Um. How, how in just a few minutes you got to understanding that dilemma that I've been trying to understand for <laughs> a few years. <laughs> and my, I mean my response to it has been sort of they've moved on, <laughs> just get over it type of a response. Okay. But what, what did you see tonight? Yeah, well... well just that the questioning um, and the, um, a um, degree of compassion, particularly coming through in terms of you know you're not the only one that's experiencing this. It's quite a common thing that sort of opens up yeah, opens up a way forward. I think in terms of uh, uh, some hope. Moving on. So yes. Yes. In my response is just it's in the past, you know. Yes, the past is in the present until the past is resolved. <laughs> and we saw that tonight. It's very much in the present for Sue. Um, just a very quick story. This is just a short story. I remember the first time my wife and I went to marriage counselling, we'd been married about 15 years, and there's issues she'd been struggling with for most of that time. And we went to see this counsellor who, to whom we were both strangers, complete strangers, and within about eight minutes, he had it all out on the table, her heart. I was sitting there, basically. And suddenly, he knew her in ten minutes, in eight minutes, he knew her at a depth of intimacy and awareness that in 15 years I hadn't even got close to. And I was sitting there, totally gobsmacked. How did he do that? See, I felt like that guy in Acts. He said to Paul, here's some money, show me how you do that. Remember that? You know? I felt like that. I thought, how do I... How does he do that? My, my wife has just opened up to him completely, a total stranger. And I've been sleeping in the same bed with her for 15 years. And I didn't know any of that stuff. She's never shared that with me. Then, well, indignant and huffy, you know. And him, he's just, just a jolly counsellor. Oh, I tell you what, it, it blew me away. Well, I made a little vow <laughs> that I wanted to be where the counsellor was in my wife's life. All right, thank you. Well, it's been a good evening. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, we thank you for the mercies and the love and the grace that we have in the gospel that in Jesus Christ, all our sins are forgiven every day by Jesus, without compulsion, without restraint, without measure. But with joy, he forgives us because he loves us, and his shed blood is sufficient. Father, we thank you for the things that we've looked at tonight and the scriptures we've looked at and the, and the issues we've grappled with as we've sought to grapple with our own hearts and understand what it would mean to step into someone's life, step into someone's world, step into someone's heart and, and with the gentle strength of Christ himself begin to ask those questions that open up the heart to gospel grace. Lord we do uh, uh, pray for Ian and Sue as they grapple with that difficult situation and ask that you would give them wisdom and courage and faith to bring that through to a, uh, a conclusion that would bring honour to the name of Christ and bring peace and joy to their own hearts. We thank you, Father, that um, 
in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we can have this safety and confidence with one another. And we thank you for the, the joy it is to be able to pour out our heart before you and find you to be a refuge for us. And, and uh, I just thank you for the diligence and faithfulness of these students to seek to put into practice every week the things that they're learning. And I thank you, Father, for the effects that are already taking place in the lives of their families and, and the people in church and people at work. And Lord, we pray you'd keep the ripples going out and, and you'd be pleased to draw many to the Saviour. In whose name we pray. Amen. Let me just remind you of our commitment to confidentiality.